when I actually was asked by my on-camera agent if I had ever considered doing voiceovers, I went, no, not particularly. And the next day I was in voiceovers. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another edition of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. Today we're heading to Gotham City, lighting up the bat signal, and see who shows up. So with no further ado, let's bring out our guest. You know him as Boy Wonder Robin, the voice of Dick Grayson. Please help me welcome at this time, Lauren Lester. Hi. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Nice to be with you. Uh, nice to be with you. Uh, where are you? Uh, and, and what part of the world are you, are you coming to us from? Well, you might hear a lot of sirens going by, so you'll be able to guess that I am in New York City. Oh, New York City. So yeah. you're, you're on the East Coast with, with some of us as well. That's right. I live in New York City now. Uh, I was born in L.A., spent my whole life in L.A., but four years ago moved here, and uh, I'm a New Yorker now. What, what prompted the move? I wanted to do a lot more theater work. And uh, that worked out great because uh, as soon as I got here, I started working in the theater. So it was, it was, I was like, okay, good move. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. I, I'm a huge uh, theater junkie. I uh, love seeing live shows. Uh, so I uh, love to hear about that. Man, I could talk about that all day. But uh, we, we, we have some other guests that will be joining us. We do? Yes, we do. And, uh, you know, when you have when you have good guys, you got to have bad guys, or in this case, a, a bad girl. You know her as the voice of Poison Ivy. Please help me welcome Diane Pershing. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you doing this uh, this afternoon? Afternoon is it noon time for it, you? It is. Yeah. No. It's it's yeah. It's noon. It's noon. It's noon. Uh, yes, I am doing so well. Thank you, Milo. Uh, I'm super glad to have you on. I've, I've seen you in passing at many a convention here, many a Galaxy Con, but I'm super glad to be able to chat with you today. Uh, it's it's going to be a good one, I think. I think so, too. And, uh, of course, we wouldn't be able to have this cast together without the casting director, the voice director. Please help me welcome at this time, Andrea Romano. Yay, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Milo. Hi, you're the only person that had to wake up at, at 9 a.m. Yes, for this. Uh, you can tell by my puffy eyes <laughs> that it's <laughs> no. only 9 o'clock in the morning here. No, but you look fantastic. I, I'm an early riser. I'm an early riser. I want to thank Lauren for making his bed today. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> looks lovely. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. Nice. nice. So that's a whole other thing from New York. <laughs> Is there a dialect at Washington, D.C. sound? Not that I've that heard. Either. Mm -hmm. No. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to have you all here today. Uh, it's uh, been a, a crazy run next month. So uh, September 5th marks the 30th anniversary of Batman the Animated Series. Unbelievable. And I'm only 32, so I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> I was a child. <laughs> wow. Or, 30. Or, were any of you comic book fans prior to uh, the auditioning and the casting process? And did any of that change after you were cast? I, I didn't read comic books at all. We, we weren't allowed to, really, because uh, at the time, the thinking was that comic books were about a fourth grade reading level, and all of our teachers wanted us to read more sophisticated work than that. But as soon as I started working on the first one, which was Batman the Animated Series, I got an incredibly quick journey through the world of DC Comics and learned a tremendous amount from those who did read comics, fans and production crew, both. And I read comics as a kid in New York, where I grew up, uh, the corner candy store. We'd go there and we'd start looking at the comics. Sometimes I actually bought them. Um, <laughs> Archie, you know, uh, Archie, those things, and, and some disgustingly scary ones but as i grew up into teenagehood or no never looked at one until i started doing cartoon voices and then if needed i would do a little research but it's not even now a big interest of mine except as it helps me talk to the fans when they come say hi sure. 
I, I was not a comic book reader at all. Um, but uh, like Diane, once uh, actually, once I started doing the uh, Comic Cons, uh, I started uh, delving into it because there were so many different Robins and so many different persona for Dick Grayson. And so I wanted to be on top of that and understand the the universe of that character. So yeah, so and and some some of my best friends now are actually comic book writers. So yeah, definitely in, into it now. That's, that's I'd like awesome. to mention something about this. There's a wonderful book written by Michael Uslin. Michael Uslin is one of those people for whom we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude for. He was the guy that brought a dark night to the world because before him, everybody was making uh, well, not everybody, but the, the most well-known Batman project was Adam West's uh, live action series, which was much more of a comedic twist on this. So he created The Dark Knight as far as movies, and he's worked on all of our shows in, in some capacity, executive producer, whatever. But he wrote a fabulous book called The Boy Who Loved Batman. And I would suggest anybody who hasn't read it to read it. You can read it in a weekend. It's such a delightful read. And he talks about being a kid and going to his local you know, candy store like you did, Diane. And and he would, he would take a little nickel that he had for that he saved up for that week to buy the most recent new comic book that came out. And the candy store owner was a nasty son of a gun. <laughs> accused him of opening two copies of the first issue of The Flash showing up wow. anywhere and forced him to buy both copies. So he like went into his emergency money and spent the, the you know, 10 cents to buy the two copies. And in the book, he uses a profanity, which is absolutely appropriate, but I'll clean it up, where he says mm -hmm. to the, the owner of the bookstore, since those are both worth about $35,000 a piece each, because they're originals, to the store owner, thank you and screw you. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Oh, is that a good story? That. The book is that's filled with those story. stories. It's really that's good. a great story. That's fantastic. That's that's fantastic. fantastic. I, yeah. I like also, I just want to point out too, and Diane has gotten this and, and, and Kevin, of course, but the people who are reading comic books and have been reading comic books since the show went off the air, they always say, I hear your voice when I read that character. And that's like the biggest compliment, thrill uh, we've ever heard. I mean, that's we've talked about this, so it's nice. That's so great. Let's, let's time travel back a little bit. Andrea, you got to know Lauren and Diane, you know, as they were auditioning, as they were being cast, you know, what memories do you have of, uh, I, I guess not necessarily seeing them, but, but hearing them and, and, you know, seeing them perform in a studio. You know, voiceover is a wonderful part of the entertainment industry. It allows people to uh, perform in a way that a live action, a, a theater show or a movie or a TV show, they would very possibly never be cast as on camera, but their voices are perfect. And so what I remember about it when I assembled that cast was that I had put together a family that liked each other. Of course, this was a time when we were still doing ensemble records. So we really became a family of almost weekly seeing each other and telling each other stories. And we could ask what happened with your kids and your family and this, and Diane, did you write another book and what's going on? So we got to really know each other. Um, there was something I wanted to mention I thought about regarding Diane, which was um, at, when the first season of Batman finished airing and we got that wonderfully positive response from people, um, I said to the head of production at the time, which was Gene McCurdy at Warner Brothers, let's put in a big thank you to all the actors and, and do a, like a full page ad in the, I think it was the reporter or variety, I forget what it was, and thank everybody because they were, you know, we had remarkable guest stars and a wonderful main cast. And I somehow, out of the hundreds of actors that I'd used, I somehow left Diane's name off of that when I submitted it for a, a, um, the, the, the print. And Diane reached out to me and said, I think you forgot me. And I was, I felt horrible. But what I said to her, but it so positively was, at least I didn't forget you when I was casting. <laughs> I may have forgotten to, forgotten to add you onto that list of wonderful actors, but I didn't forget to bring you in and have you play this role so beautifully for us for all these years. Do you remember, I you know what? And Andrea, I completely forgot that incident until just now. Yeah. So yeah. I have I have um, a way of 
not remembering things that were mildly unpleasant yeah. in the moment, although that's a wonderfully uplifting story for me now, and I thank you again. It was for my casting. pleasure. I was, I was gifted by these wonderful people that I, I cast. I remember that ad, and I remember looking at those names and just going, what? I know. Wow. Yeah. I know. What a property that people wanted to come and play. They reached out to me and said, I want to be on your new Batman series. What? Mm -hmm. Mark Hamill? Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> That's great. Now, as we're sitting here almost 25 years after the show wrapped, uh, Laura and Diane, what's going what's going through your head when, you know, a, a young fan comes up to you and, and says, this is my favorite television show or favorite cartoon, knowing that there's no no chance that they saw it during its original run? I don't think we think about that very much. Or I don't. I, I and the fact that there's no chance they saw me then, the older people have seen me in the original run. The younger people are usually children of the people who saw the original run. Um, but it was on TV in a regular way, so it almost didn't matter. It was a different time slots. It was different whatever channels, whatever. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is that they are still voracious and complimentary and filled with stories about how you change their lives. It's, I, I, I was not used to all this when I first started doing the Comic Cons. I was not used to the depth of passion and emotion that the fans have. Mm -hmm. Aren't they the best? The best. The best. The best. The best. The best. The best. Well, when we, when we were first doing the show, uh, I felt, wow, this is just a, a wonderful job. And I hope it doesn't end. It's so wonderful. And then it ended. It was like, okay, I was a little sad, but time to move on to the next, you know, project, whatever it was. Had no idea. Had no idea <laughs> that 30 years later, you know, I would be sitting here and doing an interview about it and have three generations of fans. You know, sometimes yes. at, the comic, at the Comic Cons, uh, uh, three people will come in and it's the grandfather. And the son, and then the little one is, the, you know, the grandson, and now he's in it. So I just, I just finished a, a Broadway show, a tour of a Broadway show that I did for about three years, and most of the cast was uh, young men in their twenties, and they just, they were completely <laughs> gaga that they were with the voice of Robin. Isn't that cool? It was so cool. I love so cool. that. So, so that brings me to to the point that you all continue to reprise the characters in, in, you know, later series and video games. So did you, at, at any point, did you realize, when did you realize that this was going to be a career defining goal as opposed to just a, a, a job? Never. <laughs> no, I, it, it, <clears throat> I was, I'm mostly retired now, but I was a voiceover actor for 45 years in those 45 years, how many thousands of jobs I did? This was one of the jobs I did, and it was a very pleasurable one for several years. I enjoyed it enormously, but I also was the voice of various other products or another cartoon. So it wasn't, it didn't stand out. It's only when, what was it, five years ago, somebody pointed out to me that I have a fan base from this. <laughs> and I said, what's a fan base? I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So no, it didn't, but now, oh, I know. Oh yes, I know. Well, now. I, I can say that, um, you know, I was <laughs> the first person ever to voice Nightwing, which was a great honor in itself. That's right. Um, and in the, in the uh, intervening years, uh, there have been all kinds of actors playing Nightwing and voicing Nightwing. And maybe Andre, you can, you can explain this better because I've really never understood it. Um, I only play Nightwing within the universe of the Batman the Animated Series. So if there's a game or uh, like we did Harley Quinn, the movie Harley Quinn, if it's within that universe, I play Nightwing. But I, Nightwing has not become a, uh, a, a profession for me because there are just so many projects that uh, there are other Nightwings. So... Is that right? That's got to be yeah. the universe. Yeah, there's several characters that are like that. I mean, even Harley Quinn. You think of all the different people that have played Harley Quinn, voiced it, and on camera. There was the, a desire at one point 
after the animated series wrapped, when they did start doing it, by the time it wrapped, we knew how successful it was. We knew it was special. We didn't know it would be in every way it has been, but we, we knew it was a special series. Because we were they, hit. Told yeah. Yeah. They, they told us. They told us. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then Warner Brothers got this idea that it's because it is such a popular thing. Every time that they would make a film, um, a direct to home video at the time they were called or whatever, they would they would the, the executives would say, let's recast. And it was always a battle for me to say, when I prep a script, it's Kevin Conroy's voice that I hear. It's Mark Hamill's voice that I hear. It's Lauren. It's Diane. These are the voices, not just for me, but I think for the fans as well. And sometimes I would win that argument, and sometimes I would not. Mm -hmm. And so I, I cannot tell you that I think that their um, casting of other people for these roles, and celebrities in particular, was a... a, a huge success i think fans watched batman projects because of what we made some 30 odd years ago yeah. I, I think they watched that the acting was going to be quality the voices were going to be good the stories the art that's what they liked and i i think that um the executives just looked at this as a possibility and you know what happens you guys know you've been in the business for so long yes. Celebrity yes. Yes. is the yes. idea that somebody wants to spend a couple of hours in a room with some one of their favorite celebrities they would just say let's bring in so and so for this role well that's not really the best casting why do you want to do that i love that guy and i want to that's you know what i mean it's just so I had to fight battles quite often about that but you know i think for most people when they think of batman animated they think of our series. They think of the first, the original cast and the original series. Well, they tell yeah. us that. I mean, they tell us that at the Comic Cons. And so I'm glad you answered that because I really didn't know how to answer very often when people say, Hey, I just played the such and such game. Why weren't you Nightwing? Right. And I'm like, right. <laughs> And I, I've, I've, I've had a similar thing. You know, how long did you do it? I said, Well, I did it through this, through this, through this. And then um, I said, I believe that the studio wanted to go with more celebrity names. And mm -hmm. so I didn't have the job anymore. That's what I usually say. Mm -hmm. that, that, that often yeah. that's often yeah. very true, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and, you know, I watch, I, I vote on all the Emmys. I'm on all those committees and stuff. And, and I looked at the Emmy submissions this year for voiceover. And 90% of them were celebrities who do not make their living doing this. And who... Why, we who know that. Them. Yes. You know, yes, we who... We do. And so we I, who I, made our living doing voiceovers remember when the celebrities said, oh, wow, this is cool. I, I know. Do this. Yeah. And it cut out 75% of the work. Especially yep. the ones with kids, the, the celebrities right. with kids, because right. like, hey, uh, you know, daddy or mommy's in a in a in a cartoon. In <laughs> something that they their kids can watch, because you think about how often, like someone who works on a CSI, for example, chances are their five year old really should not be watching that show because they were very graphic and yes, uh, the Batman animated series. Even though there was some violence, and we really had to cut back on some of the stuff that we wanted to show. If you think about it, you guys. There's maybe five episodes in the whole series that show any blood at all. We couldn't even show blood. And so, yeah. but, it, but it still, you know, it still worked. It still had the excitement of that kind of action and physicality and stuff. But it's, um, it, it, it's absolutely true. And I used to joke about this, that the only voiceover actors that celebrity-wise that worked initially were uh, Tony Curtis as Stony Curtis and Anne Margaret as Anne Margrock in the Flintstones. And then we went for years where no celebrities did voices, yeah. you know? Even, um, what's his name? Um, what's the wonderful actor who did Mr. Magoo? Um, Bacchus, the, Jim Bacchus. Jim Bacchus. Even he wasn't really a big celebrity, as it were, like there is now doing cartoons. So many, many celebrities work on cartoons now. Now, Diane, you mentioned, you know, it wasn't until about five years ago that you realized that you had this, you know, gigantic fan base and you're doing conventions. Uh, Lauren as well. So tell me about your, uh, your action figure shrine to yourselves. Do you, do you have any of that memorabilia, any toys, action figures, posters? What all do you have? And when did you start collecting? Do you have a room? Lauren, right, you have something. Uh, oh, I have trunks filled with them in a storage space, trunks full of every uh, Nightwing or Robin memorabilia, piece of memorabilia I could get, all the comic books, every, I have it all. 
And, uh, you know, I do these uh, comic cons where people bring me that stuff and I recognize, oh, I have that. <laughs> and, and, and then they, they, you know, they buy a signature, they buy an autograph. And then my, um, my manager, uh, Diane's manager too, uh, told me, he said, well, you're keeping that all in trunks, but you should like go and sign everything. And I said, really? He said, yeah. So I went to the store space and I opened all this stuff. And I signed, you know, all these things. So there you go. It'll be valuable one day. I'm the exact opposite. I, I have a, a Warner Brothers gave me one of the uh, original cells, and I have that framed. Yeah. Nice. Um, nice. I have, I have a, a st little statue of Poison Ivy, and uh, that's, <laughs> about it. that's that's about it. I, I don't know why my mind doesn't work that way. I guess. And a lot of fan art too, though we we both get. Oh yeah, that I have. People give me pictures and stuff, and there's some really erotic pictures. Of it's wild, especially with like poison ivy. Yeah. Oh, it's a oh sexy my god! Anyway, I know it's crazy. Really, crazy. really erotic. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Andrea, you've done uh, many, many projects. Uh, do you have a collection of uh, figures, artwork, posters I, of stuff? I wish I were on a on a computer that I could pick up and show you. I, I'm sitting next to an enormous shelf of black hats that are just, I, I mean, everything from Avatar and SpongeBob and they're all shows I worked on. And uh, Justice League and Batman and Superman and Teen I mean, tons. I have, I too have crates of things. And um, although I didn't sign them, which is a really interesting idea, but I, I mean, they're actually something that, because I'm aware that they're valuable, not just because they're memorabilia, but because they were mine. Which is such a weird thing to say it's more valuable because it was mine. But, uh, you know, it's actually something that I've indicated in my trust who gets that stuff because the whole collection is valuable. I don't know that any one piece is particularly valuable, but I do have things like I have an original Jetsons cell from when I was working at Hannah Barbera from the entire original cast signed the... Uh, the matting around it and things like that, which and I'm sure that's a pretty valuable piece all by itself, but I have dozens and dozens of cells, Batman cells, um, Justice League cells. I mean, so much stuff like that. And I, I value them. I think they're wonderful. I have a lot of them out, but dusting is hell. <laughs> Little flashes. I think that's, that's our show right back there, isn't it? That that horizontal, is that? Uh, right that's, that's Superman. Oh, it's Superman. Oh, the Superman villains, that yeah. one is. But I have those. I have the lineups, which were production lineups. Yeah. And when I had them framed, it was so funny because the person framing them said, I, I tried to make really sure that I left the artist's name on the bottom there that's in Sharpie there where it says day. And I said, that just means that's their day colors. That's a reference point for artists to know what colors to paint the characters. If it's a night scene... There's a whole other lineup, of same characters, but with different colors. But I thought it was wow. very strange that I thought they were honoring the artist by leaving their name Day out of the frame. <laughs> great story. <laughs> or great story. It's, cool that it's that the reference is there to begin with. So anybody who wants to see it from this point on still gets that oh, reference. Right, right. And right. as Johnny Carson would say, I did not know that. <laughs> Are you ready for some fan questions here? Oh, heck yeah. Sure. So our first question comes from Peter, and great question. What voice is the one that inspired you to pursue voice acting? Mm. Well, you know, growing up, uh, the master of all masters was Mel Blanc. And uh, I, although I never pictured myself doing that as a job, I always pictured myself more in on camera things or theater. Um, when I started doing it, I thought, oh, wow, uh, standing on the shoulders of a, of a giant. So, yeah. And I, I'm i going to date myself, but then that's not difficult to do. Um, when I was a child, we were very late getting television. And I loved radio. Mm -hmm. And I would listen to these radio dramas the Romance of Helen Trent, <laughs> uh, all of these, I mean, these amazing radio dramas, and I would imitate the voices along with them. Mm -hmm. And I would go, God, this is fun. Mm -hmm. And then even before I started voiceovers, I was hired on a children's television show to do puppet voices. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the, the other, somebody else was animating uh, up above at this little cute stage, and I was doing their voices singing. Dusty's I was tree singing. house, right? Dusty's Dusty's, Dusty's tree house. Oh, with the no late, the late Stu Rosen, yeah, wow. yeah. And I love doing that because I I would do both Cinderella and I would do Cinderella over here, and then and the fairy godmother who spoke <laughs> like that. I had the best time. But when I actually was asked by my on-camera agent if I had ever considered doing voiceovers, I went, no, not particularly. And the next day I was in voiceovers. <laughs> really, that's exactly what, what happened, you know? Yeah. Uh, Andrea, uh, you, you know, being a, a voice director, a casting director, what, what voices inspired you? You know, I was a huge cartoon fan as a kid, uh, and you both, you, all of you, you're much younger than us, Milo, but we remember the days the cartoons aired Saturday morning and weekday afternoons, and that was it. We had a couple of hours a week. There was no 24-hour cartoon network. There was nothing like that. And so I would rush home from school to go sit on my mom and dad's big, double bed in their bedroom with the good TV <laughs> and watch, you know, all the classic Hanna-Barbera stuff. I just adored them. I, I took great comfort in watching Fred Flintstone run past the same vase and table in those really inexpensive made cartoons, but they were delightful. And my mother and I left out this years later when I said, you know, because I would hear her car return to the driveway home from work, and I knew, oh man, I got to turn the TV off and clean bed up and be doing whatever chore I was supposed to be doing because I'm one of eight kids. We all had chores when we got home. And I said to my mom, did you ever know that I was up there? And she said, honey, those were the days when TVs, when they cooled down, they clicked. And so she came home from work went upstairs to change her clothes and heard the TV clicking. No, I was there. Busted. <laughs> and I said, did oh, it work out for me? And she was like, I knew something would. So. <laughs> and that's so I love the Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Those were my favorites. I love Dawes Butler's work and Mel Blanc's work and uh, Don Messick and the beautiful Janet Waldo and Jean Vanderpile and all those wonderful June Foray, all those wonderful like you, Diane, were they, they were on those uh, radio shows that you listened to. They had that experience. So for them, it was kind of an easy segue into exactly. Voice yeah. They already yeah. been the work behind the microphone. Yeah, yeah. And I, I never, I ne I'm just, just quickly, this will be done in a second. I never watched cartoons as a kid. Done. <laughs> well, I remember the, the voices that I first started imitating, though. Uh, I, I would do Bugs Bunny and the Mel Blanc voices. But really, remembering now, the ones that I really started imitating first were the Jay Ward cartoons. Oh, I love them so. Because ah. there was such a, 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 um, a, uh, a, a wink, you know, about all of their, oh, all of their stuff. Absolutely. You know, that would be these old time radio one hour. <laughs> you know, so I would do those Hans voices. Hans Conried and all yes. of those guys yeah. that did those great voices. Oh, Hans Conried. I yeah. loved him. I did too. Great question. Thank you so much, Peter. Our next question comes from Anonymous. Uh, what were your first acting jobs? And Andrea, did you start out as an actor? Do you guys want to take that question first? Your first actor? Yeah, no, you first. All right. You first. Um, uh, I did start as an actor. Yes, I did. I, when I was really young, like 10 years old, when little girls start thinking about things like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I wanted to be in the entertainment industry in some way. I, I didn't really know in what capacity, doing what. I knew I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. I also knew I wanted to be married to someone from another country who spoke with an accent <laughs> and ideally an artist. And next month I'll celebrate 31 years with Rogério Nogueira, a Brazilian artist. So that all worked out. Um, checked all the boxes. There you go. <laughs> but um, I, I did high school plays and loved it so, and studied acting in college and then studied in graduate school, studied with Bill Esper and, and really liked it. I'm sorry, it's Los Angeles. Is that you? Or <laughs> no, that's me. New York. <laughs> We've Gotham, been New York. Here too. Um, uh, it's actually I, Gotham City. So. Yeah, it, it, it is Gotham City. So but I, uh, well. I loved acting, but when I moved to California, I oh nice, nice. <laughs> when I moved to California, I the first work that I did, I took some acting classes here and stuff, but uh, I worked as an agent <laughs> assistant. <laughs> 
and then got franchised and became a voiceover agent, and then a casting director, and then a casting director and a director, voice director. So, but but and I believe that being an actor first gave me an understanding of what actors go through, just to get to the session, just to get to the audition, to the point where they have an audition. I understood it and sympathized with it, and gave as much of a positive environment for actors as possible. But which yes, is what you did. Which is what yeah, you did, yeah, lady. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my first two, go ahead. My my first two professional jobs I will never forget. One was a on camera commercial, and I did commercials for many 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 years. So my first on camera job was on a commercial, and uh, I remember what it was for is for Twist, which was a, a powdered drink mix that I'm sure was causing everyone cancer. <laughs> And then, and then, but what are you going to do? And then the the other first job I had was my first voiceover job. I had them both at about the same time, and I got to do a Hanna Barbera uh, after school special oh, cool. called Five Weeks in a Balloon, and uh, it was about Phineas Fogg from Around the World in Eighties Days, days, and his uh, his nephew, his Texas nephew, and they're flying around in a balloon, and uh, it was. Uh, Quite wonderful, right out, of, right out of the gate. What's that? Were you the Texas nephew? I was Texas nephew. Nice. So coming coming right out of the gate to to get to be in the hallowed how the hallowed halls of uh, HB um, or the haunted uh, house, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yes. What year would this have been? I'm curious, Lauren. What year was that? That would be 1979. Okay. All right. Yeah. Before we, my time, I had a it was it was before your time. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, and I, I, I've been do, I did plays all through junior high, um, high school. I majored in theater arts at UCLA. I'm trying to think of when I, uh, I got uh, actually my first professional job was as a singer, and, and there were several of those. I was a backup singer for Johnny Mathis, who a lot of the generation never heard of. Right? Yeah. No, I was. I was kind of good, yeah. I was a surprise. I'm not surprised at all. I'm surprised I didn't know this about your history. That's a fantastic. Oh, I have such. Oh God. Anyway, don't get me started, <laughs> as they say. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember my first acting job was theater. Uh, I did theater in Los Angeles, Equ Equity Waiver Theater. We got a, a pittance of money, but I did quite a lot of theater in Los Angeles. And on camera, the only thing I really ever did was a couple of background things and a commercial for a mop. <laughs> and, 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 but, but the voiceovers came in. And, and Well, first of all, I spent 10 years on the road as a backup singer with a lot of very various and singing groups and rock and roll groups and stuff like that. But the voiceover stuff started my first, my first paying voiceover job after the um, puppets, okay, was the, for seven years, I was the spokesperson for J.C. Penney in Southern California. Wow. So good gig. that was really nice. Yeah. yeah it was I, I want to make one uh, observation, if I may, which is that I have observed over the many years that people with theater experience on stage, live performing, yes. trans transfer into voiceover so much better than Amen. people strictly on camera actors. Because exactly. on camera actors work small. They have to work small. The camera's right there in their face, catching everything. Uh, on stage, back before everybody was body mic'd, you learned projection, you used, you had to be a little bit larger, still real, but larger than life. And that's what a lot of cartoon acting is. Larger than life, a little bit, but still within the realm of reality. At least our Batman acting. No, oh, totally. And Lauren and I are both singers. Right. And we have all that training. We have that breath control. We we know how to not pop a mic. We know. I mean, we know all that stuff. So I think we came to the business with a lot of extra tools. Yep. And stage you know, allows you to be really silly. Really, you 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 get quite a bit of leeway to be yeah. very very silly. And that, larger than life. Yeah. Yes, and that helps. Yeah. You know. So what I'm hearing is that at our next GalaxyCon live convention, uh, we will have. Batman the musical. Absolutely. And, and Lauren will uh <laughs> oh, we often. often. We joked about that all the time because <laughs> we wanted to do I mean those of us who love musicals wanted there to be a Batman musical. Bruce Tim was not interested in doing that. However, we ultimately did do a Batman Beyond that they went to a play in Gotham. It was the Batman story on 
stage. And so Kevin actually did sing as Batman. And it was that silly, very broad, you know, Batman, Batman, Batman. I mean, it was very overdone. And the person who should write the songs uh, for the new musical would be Paul Williams. Paul so Williams, we exactly. So we're all set. Oh, yeah. And, Paul right. with, uh, and Raleigh with us as well. Oh, so nice. it's good all coming you. together. We're, we're good making good. it happen. Good, good, good. All right. Thank you. Great question. Uh, our next question comes from Jolene. What is the, what is one of your most memorable and positive fan interactions? I, w I want to take this one first, if I may. Okay, absolutely. There was a Comic Con, and I think it was New York, and this guy walked up to it was the autograph signing lines that they would have, and this guy walked up, and, and he was quite intimidating looking. He, he was uh, uh, um, tall and strong and really defined muscles and clearly a tough guy. And he came up to me and he said, you changed my life. I was absolutely going to be a gang member in trouble for the rest of my life, probably in jail. I had all kinds of bad things, but I discovered Batman, the animated series, and I would spend time watching it and it somehow calmed me, he said, and, and gave me a sense of what is right and what is wrong which I think is so remarkable that we were able to do that for anybody. And I remember he, he moved me to tears, this guy. I'm telling you, this was a big, strong, looking like a gang leader guy. And if I remember, if I'm not confusing two of these fans, he had Batman um, tattoos on yes. him. And he would ask me, this guy asked me to sign my autograph on his shoulder. And he left the Comic-Con and went to his tattoo artist and had it tattooed and, and he had everybody he had Kevin's he had a whole bunch of people's sig autographs tattooed on his body with the Batman art remarkable remarkable <sighs> good story okay. right. shall I shall I go next because yeah. yeah. this one is the one that touched me so much it was one of the first cons that I did and this young woman came up and she was crying and she was shaking and I remember thinking oh dear um because I didn't know what what? And she said, you changed my life. And I said, I'm so pleased that I did. And I, I, I uh, t tell me about it. And she said, Poison Ivy's character taught me that I don't have to put up with the abuse going on in my home. Okay. She said, when, when Poison Ivy told Harley that she mustn't let a man push her around like that, she said, I didn't know there was any other way. And I don't know if it was just sexual or emotional or physical. I don't know what it was. But whatever it was, she said, I learned that day that there was a different way. And I'm sitting there and I start crying with her because that's, you do a job. You do a job at that point 25 years before. You do your job, you love your job, you love the way you make your living, but you go to the next job. You have no idea what kind of effect you're having on the people that are watching the results of you being in a studio doing the job. You have no idea. It's That's a great story. It still moves me. It's we, just amazing. I remember that episode that you referenced. I remember that. Yes. yes. We, we have a, a large fan base, people who are in their 30s now, who were what were called latchkey kids. I don't think anybody mm -hmm. uses that expression anymore. Right. But then it meant, you know, you go home and nobody's home, but you have a key and you can go inside and you can, you know, be on your own. And um, I cannot count the number of times I have met people who said, you saved my life. And that's just, just incredible to hear that. Had no idea, like you said, Diane, because when they came home, it was the one thing they could count on. You know, bad day at school, struggling in school, parents coming home, maybe abusive parents, some of them living with grandparents. You know, one thing they could count on was they could come in, sit down in front of the TV and, and watch our show and uh, be an anchor in their lives. And that just, wow. I heard, series, I heard it so much, you know. It's, this series was not just a cartoon. And, and in that way, it changed the whole paradigm of the way animation was done and what animation was meant to do, which was not just entertain anymore. It was really making a difference about 
uh, about people's lives. Yeah. It told stories that touched people. Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. Sorry, my computer's no. talking to me. Um, <laughs> Siri, Siri thinks I was talking to her. Sorry. Uh, but, but that's amazing when you think about it, you guys, that it was not at all what cartoons were before that. No, absolutely. I remember, I'm, hold on, I'm going to kill Siri. Um, <laughs> I, I, I remember uh, my sister, who was in publishing, sent me once a, um, a article from the New Yorker about what cartoon, what shows were being watched by the inmates on Rikers Island. Mm. And the shows were, uh, they were watching some of the, like, Maury Povich and those kind of, <laughs> right. but then they would all go back, to, and this is how the article read, they would all go back to their cells for head count, and then it was a mad rush to the rec room to watch the cartoons, and their favorite cartoons were Batman, Superman, Kiki and the Brain. But I, I just, I, I think it's remarkable the people that responded to our work. It was a, an wow. amazing cross section of America. Absolutely, and here you wow. are again, 30, 30 years later, and we're we're still, still talking, talking about, about it. it. Uh, you're still wow. making that impression on young fans. Uh, Jolene, thank you so much for your question. Uh, that is going to be our time for today. Ooh. Lauren, uh, Diane, Andrea, thank you so much. Do you have any last words that you would like to give to our fans watching at home. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank, <laughs> you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Great minds. And and oh, also yes. and and also um, you are you are the ones keeping this uh, this incredible dream alive and for uh, generation after you too. So thank you thank for that. You well. again. Yeah. Yep. Thank Amen. You. Absolutely. Well, it has been my honor to host for you today. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this virtual stage here at mm -hmm. GalaxyCon. And thank you, everybody who is watching at home. And thank you all for your great questions. Uh, we hope to see you very soon at a show. Uh, until then, be safe. Thank you. Thank you.